Welcome to the Southern Maryland Audubon Society. I'm Molly Moore, one of Audubon's directors. Our speaker, Chris Fry, may have one of the best job descriptions ever. He has been Maryland's chief botanist for the past 26 years with the Wildlife and Heritage Service and the Department of Natural Resources. He leads efforts to manage and preserve the state's rare, threatened, and endangered native plants. He maintains the state's rare plants list and is the curator of vascular plants at the Department of Natural Resources, Taws Herbarium in Annapolis. Chris, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your research and knowledge on your incredibly important work. So now over to you. Oh, thank you, Molly. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, you know, I've gotten used to Zoom meetings as everyone else has you know, over the last couple of years. And so I'll let down your expectations a little bit <laughs> in that I wish I was better at PowerPoint and I wish I was a better photographer. Many times I will, by the time I remember to take a good photograph, it's after I've already left the site. Um, Zoom has opened some more opportunities just because I spend most of my time in the lab, the herbarium or in the field, which is a... Um, uh, way of saying I don't get out much. <laughs> so Zoom allows me to get out a little bit more. So we'll start, and I'm just titling this an introduction to the rare, threatened, endangered plants of Maryland. I don't want to talk a lot about, you know, um, the statistics of how that goes, although I will present, you know, one, one pie chart. I thought it would start with a nice photo of Mather Gorge. Um, at Great Falls is one of those places where there's a, you know, a huge number of rare plants packed into a very small space. And um, rare plants packed into very small areas and, and small populations is sort of a theme for the day. And uh, Mather Gorge has one of my, uh, one of my favorite, little, favorite little creatures, which is uh, Nantucket Shadbush, which is globally rare, and it's the most bizarre floral arrangement you'll ever see. But I'll talk a little more about Shadbush later in just a bit. So um, I thought in this presentation, the first part is all about me because, you know, I, even though I've been around for 26 years, again, I haven't gotten out much and uh, don't spend a lot of time out with, uh, with the public because I'm pretty busy out with uh, the plants. But I'm going to keep that very brief. I'm going to. Um, the second part contains some basics. Um, you know, you need at least one pie chart for any presentation. The third part is just associated with the immense amount of data that comes into our program every year. You know, new county records, new populations, new needs for management, and how that data is managed. And, but happily for all of us, I'll spend nearly the entire presentation talking about some plant conservation projects. So um, I've worked in the Natural Heritage Network for over 30 years. I started my career in North Carolina. In the last 26 years, I've been Maryland State botanist. I received my undergraduate from uh, Catawba College in Salisbury, North Carolina, and received a fellowship to complete my graduate degree at Wake Forest University. So I spend a lot of my time looking up, <laughs> you know, to record canopy cover and those sorts of things around rare plant populations. Uh, I spend a lot of my time doing very tedious things uh, up close. I've got a 10x objective in one eye doing some pollinations of Cates Mountain Clover, which is this endemic uh, native clover to uh, Western Maryland shale barren region. Do a lot of rare plant monitoring, things like fringe gentian. Um, and then I tend to take an experimental approach to answering some basic questions in plant conservation biology. I am inordinately fond of sedges. I love teaching about diversity in sedges. Uh, although COVID and the spate of retirements and departures within my department have taken a toll on my fondness of teaching field courses, but I hope to get back to that sometime soon. Oh, this is going to work. So 
So um, I started writing about rare plants before DNA sequencing became a reality. So I began my career um, uh, in plant conservation genetics, which is part of my uh, education using uh, proteins. And so that, I think that's probably my first publication about a, a rare orchid in North Carolina. Um, I spent a lot of time working on the taxonomy of shadbush um, and then full geek in a number of uh, publications with a great group from the University of Maine. We wrote the treatment for the floor of North America. A strange combination of a field botanist and evolutionary biologist. I love figuring out plant mating systems and yes, plants mate. And sometimes I just have um, interesting questions to ask, such as uh, why are all these lupin flowers aborting? And Sarah Tangren and I worked on that uh, a few years ago. I am also the curator of vascular plants for the Tall's Herbarium in Annapolis, where I'm the uh, collections manager. There's a little bit of delay in the uh, shots coming up. There we go. Um, collections manager, I am the director of the herbarium, and I'm also the general herbarium grunt. Uh, the Talls Herbarium is a member of the Mid-Atlantic Herbarium Consortium, and thanks to a National Science Foundation um, funded project, all of the specimens, well, 4,800 and 5,000 specimens of talls are imaged and that data is available you know, to the public, with, with, of course, with some restrictions. But uh, let's just move on to some plants. Uh, there's a great photograph there is by R the late Richard Wigand, and that's the uh, purple fringe, large purple fringed orchid, which is just gorgeous. So let's get to some of the basic stats. Um, there are around um, 2,096 species, native species, uh, in the Maryland flora. That's a, that's, a, that's a very large number. So if you look at the entire pie, that's 2,096. The good news is that of those 2,096 native species, about 65% of them are not rare. Um, they may not be incredibly common, but they're just not on the rare, threatened, endangered species list of Maryland. The problem is that nearly a third are. So there are 75 species that are listed as state threatened. That's about 3.6% of the total. There are 246 endangered species in Maryland, about almost 12%. There are 67 extirpated species. In other words, these are things that we haven't seen for more than a century. That's about 3.2% of the total. And then of the rare species, what that means is that it has a state rank somewhere between historical or um, S1 to S3. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about the ranking system, but this means there's some level of rarity. Um, so it's about 17% of the total aren't listed as threatened or endangered, but are considered, are considered rare. So there's your pie chart. The reasons for that rarity, and I don't intend anyone to be able to read any of that. That's not the point. So the reasons for rarity are our latitude, right dead center of uh, Eastern North America. The east to west breadth crosses five different physiographic provinces. And there's a concomitant geological complexity. So if you look at all of those little bands and all those little colors in this map, that's a different geologic formation. And each one of those uh, geologic formations has a fairly distinct flora. So we're, everything's packed in and we're typically at the uh, northern end of the range for southern plants and we're at the southern end of the range for um, northern plants. So that's one of the reasons that we have you know, our, our state list is, is quite large. So um, quick mention is that the data that's required to produce 
the rare threatened and endangered plants of Maryland at um, 231 pages with uh, that's fully indexed with and also with the full literature cited there the RTE list rare threatened and endangered plants of Maryland is the largest publication I've ever produced so we have the list and then every year there's this data stream coming in that comes in from various sources you know I naturalists uh, Maryland Biodiversity Project, who's a great partner, and as these specimens that are in, are imaged under uh, this National Science Foundation um, grant, I find more and more records, typically historical, for rare species. Um, so I have to curate all those updates until I turn in something called um, an element state ranking form, which goes into the big database that's shared amongst all 50 states and all the Canadian provinces. It's called biotics. And then finally, um, I have to reconcile the taxonomy with our standard is weekly's floor of the southeastern United States, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. And so um, there's a spate of emails that go back and forth between me and Alan, me and my, uh, the Maryland Biodiversity Project, and with our, our data manager. And it is just an enormous task all of its all in it itself. Um, just give a good shout out. I don't have the, the stats for the Maryland Biodiversity Project or the Maryland Plan Atlas. So this is still showing 2020, uh, but this will give you some example of what comes in. Uh, and this is just the plants. This isn't the animals or the insects. So they're, you know, over 3,000 contributors. There were over 12,000 photographs that were submitted of 427,000 um, photographs. And there are a little over 200,000 records that are being curated just by the Maryland Biodiversity Project. But it's a flow. Uh, my data goes to MBP. MBP's data comes back to me. And, um, and that all goes into, you know, the for the at least for the rare species that all goes back into the uh, rare threatened endangered plants of maryland but so what i will spend my time talking about is um, a number of management projects restoration projects and species safeguarding projects and species safeguarding safeguarding just means you're trying to prevent that species from becoming extirpated from the state so a short little introduction for each one of these projects, which we'll take in order. So in, in Wacomico County, there's a neat little place called Sharptown Bog, and it's tiny. It's, um, it, but it probably has more threatened endangered species than sites that are a hundred times larger. Idlewild Fen is also this tiny little spot, um, and its importance is not in the number or any particular rare threatened or endangered species rather it's the total diversity of things and it's there in the, the unique features of this little spot suitable seep is another small spot with a very rare, rare occurrence of something called grass of parnassus parnassia or sarifolia and it's an only known occurrence uh, it was in trouble and needed a little tender loving care um, Plucanet cyparis is a species safeguarding project. It was missing from the floor. In other words, we hadn't seen it for over a century. And uh, to keep the species on the Maryland landscape, it, it, took, some, it took some doing. Um, and finally, um, red milkweed uh, is a species that's under severe decline in Maryland. The situation that was so dire that um, uh, um, I just had an oh no moment and some, some dramatic efforts have been made to try to keep that uh, species um, in, its, in its initial, I mean, in its original habitat. And finally, at the end, we'll talk about the importance of restoring fire to the landscape. An example would be a you know, number of rare plants at the Idlewild Dunes in, in Carolina County. So um, the first one is Sharptown Bog. And if you look at the photo on the right, you can see a lot of stems and you see some little 
some pitcher plant colonies underneath. Uh, so that was um, in 2019. We have all these pitcher plant bog, I mean, pitcher plants that are um, um, sort of shading everything out. It had just really become a hedge. And oddly enough, it, the species that was eliminating the habitat for all of these rare plants and essentially drawing the water out of the bog was a native. It was inkberry, Ilex glabra. And so it's in a terrible place. It's uh, two private uh, landowners and a large utility company that has the management authority. But then you know, shout out to Delmarva Power. I was the first person that they, they contacted and I hadn't been there, you know, more than probably, probably more than a decade because it is on private property. So um, we started a project um, to try to restore this little open, thin bog area. So the orange flags are where we marked, you know, pitcher plant colonies. So what you're looking at is the post herbicide application, and it was a complete woody kill. So it's just a thicket of, of dead stems. So only about 10 feet of that little bog is open. I'm actually standing in the creek looking uphill and there's an incredibly rare orchid that grows there. It's the only place we know it from. And it's sort of uphill and to the right in that, in that dense, dense thicket. We'll get to that in just a little bit. So there's the uh, spreading begonia. It's uh, Clystiopsis uh, divaricata. It's just, it's, it's so pretty, you don't even think that it's real. Um, you know, it looks like someone took a little silk flower and stuck it out in the uh, <laughs> stuck it out in the woods. So that's the restoration area that I've marked out with some pink flagging. So at that point, it's just down to um, it's down to um, brush axe and machete clearing. And so I'm about um, you know a third of the way through in this photograph. At some point, I was able to remove almost all of the, uh, the woody dead stems from the uh, pitcher plant uh, location. And then in 2020, it kind of looked like this. You know, there's still a few dead stems here and there, but it was restored back to a low wet meadow bog. And so there we have a lovely photograph of some recovering and very robust uh, pitcher plants, which is just an incredible organism. And then this year, I had a couple of, uh, or last year rather, I had a couple of surprises. One was cross leaf milkwort, it's this tiny little thing. And in our data, you would see that when reports of this species come across, you know, it's somewhere between five and, um, and 15 plants. And um, so when I put it this way, I stopped counting when I got to 500. So, it responded very, very well. And the other one was something new. I don't even know that it had been recorded from the site. It's um, Engelman's um, arrowhead, which is uh, a state a, a state endangered species. Grows, sort of grows in the you know, wettest portion of the bog. So uh, to say I was a tickled pink is um, an understatement. And um, you know, I'm not afraid of snakes, <laughs> but uh, this, king snake and it sh certainly it sh couldn't have been the same snake over and over um it delighted in appearing right under my feet or sometimes right on my boots which um gives gives me a little gives me a little jolt every time that i go there the second site um as an example, again, of returning to a site after a decade and finding the habitat very altered. And again, it wasn't kudzu or some horrible invasive species from China. It was just growth of native, almost all native shrubs. So um, the fin is, is, again, it's tiny, it's less than a hectare. But there was very little open meadow left for these species like the rose begonia, which is one of our loveliest orchids is sort of to the, to the left and top. Um, there are seven species of bladder warts for these tiny little carnivorous plants. And that's at the bottom, it's the little yellow flowers. And it's one of the, um, um, one of four sites for that tiny little dragonfly uh, called the elfin skimmer. 
Um, the elfin skimmer requires some open habitat. The peonia requires open habitat, and all of the uh, bladder warts, the utricularias, require some open habitat. So, um, gathered a, a little crew, some from Annapolis and some from Southern Maryland, and we went in with some some machinery. So there's there's Paula um, working on open, reopening the meadow. So we use brush cutters and chainsaws to remove you know, some of the woody plants, of course, not all of them. So after clearing, um, the woody stems were um, painted with uh, an herbicide that doesn't spread, so it's not soil active, so that we wouldn't have to contend with um, you know, the tons and tons of uh, sucker sprouts. And um, so that's after, uh, after it was cleared, and it's a very different location, and I hope to have some great pictures, um, you know, this, this summer of the fen and its open meadow, uh, back to its restored fen and open meadow conditions. There are a lot of happy plants. So, um, it's not much to look at. I know that. It's not a lily, it's not an orchid, it's not something gorgeous. And so in the center of that photograph, you see this little weird plant with these long arching, you know, culms. So that's a cyperus. Um, it's in the sedge family. And it has a, the range, if you take a peek, so in the map, you see the states where it's present. Uh, and each one of those little colored um, um, polygons is, is a county of occurrence. And you can see that once it makes it out of the North Carolina or the Carolina sand hills, it becomes incredibly rare. So a few counties in Virginia, and you have these incredibly rare occurrences that were all historical um, for, for Delmarva, for Maryland and Delaware. In Delaware, it was considered extirpated. In Maryland, it was considered extirpated. Um, so they have this extremely rare species that was adapted to a fire regime and an ecosystem that essentially was extinct because all of those habitats had been converted to um, either seceded to dense, you know, canopy oak hickory forests or had been converted to, um, you know, loblolly pine plantations. So, you know, it's a big deal when you have people from New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland all showing up to see this plant when it was rediscovered. So, this is the rediscovery site. Um, down near Salisbury. And to the left is the late Ron Wilson, who was a fantastic botanist, worked for, worked for us as a contractor and spent many, many decades working for the Nature Conservancy, um, standing um, just immediately to the right is Jason Harrison, our um, restoration ecologist, Anthony Silva, who works for Delmarva Power, and then Bill McAvoy, my counterpart in Delaware, is kneeling. So we found um, there were 12 plants, which really isn't a population, but it was 12 plants. But again, it was in an awful place. It's basically in the city in a little power line area. And um, so all of those kinds of places are you really can't call, they're not, it's not, certainly not protected, but also the management authority is not ours to have. Uh, so if you just imagine, you know, one contractor spray in the wrong mix or the wrong time, that species would be gone. And again, we had not seen it in over a century. So here it was. So before we left that site, uh, we collected seed from the 12 plants that were left. Uh, for safeguarding is there were no protected sites. Actually, that's the only site for that species. So those seed went to another partner um, up in Delaware, the Mount Cuba Center. They're devoted, dedicated um, to plant conservation projects. And they grew out uh, the initial batch was about 17 of those, those little pots. And so we had a reintroduction spot. Um, they were introduced into a natural area down in Worcester County. And um, so that's me, we were beginning to set them out and it's um, for monitoring purposes, 
uh, there's a you know concrete marker in the ground and you orient basically that thing that's sitting on top that's the little square it's a, just an enlarged compass dial so that as you plant something you know every plant has an angle and a distance from that central point um, the uh, good news is that when we monitored those for the first year, 12 of those 17 plants had survived and were reproducing, which is really, really good news for something that we haven't seen for over you know, a century. So now we have it in this um, inland dune woodland landscape, and you'll notice there are very, very few trees. It's more of a prairie. Uh, grassland, uh, shrubland. So there's a um, great volunteer who works for the Nature Conservancy, Mike Wool, planting uh, plants. We just used um, post hole diggers. It's pretty much just deep, dry sand, so it's easy, easy to uh, work them into the environment. And uh, a little update: um, after um, a prescribed fire on a slightly different section of the dune we uh, had 58 additional plants that were able to install from the Mount Cuba Center. And, um, and this year I have um, some more plants to mix in from a second site in Worcester County that I just happened to see. It's, again, it's under a power line and it was a timber, uh, timber harvest review and I was driving down this power line right away and uh, so this other population, it consisted of five plants. So we did the same thing, uh, collected seed from those five plants, sent them out to Cuba. So hopefully we'll be able to capture some of the genetic diversity that was initially out there. So um, waiting for additional burns and the, uh, the first location that you saw um, with us planting the first 17, it just went up in smoke this morning. So there was a prescribed burn and apparently it went fairly well and I can't wait to see the results. I mean, a lot of these plants will do okay under a power line or someplace that's commonly cleared, but the response to fire is just dramatic. Um, so this is um, closer, to your, closer to your area. This is, um, uh, our only known occurrence of this, this extraordinary little little plant, uh, kidney leaf grass of Parnassus. It's just gorgeous. And those photographs were taken by Jennifer Selfridge. And so uh, again, it had been a while, uh, a very small group. It's impossible to go to all of our locations for all of our rare plants every year. So it had been a long time since anyone had been to that site, but um, in 2019, Jen went out looking for this bee that's in the top left, Adrena parnassia. It's a very rare uh, bee associated that's a pollinator of this particular plant. And so she starts sending me text messages and it's like, I can't find it, essentially is what she said. So eventually she did find a few plants, but it only seemed like seven of them had flowered and only one plant in the population had set fruit. Um, so again, that's sort of a dramatic wake up call that something's wrong. So the previous data, um, uh, oh, it probably had been 20 years at that point, had said there were over 1000 flowering plants. So that's a huge, huge decline and something has to, has to happen. So what we decided to do was just try some. We thought well, maybe it's just you know, the lack of sunlight because um, um, you know, the, uh, this, little, this little seepage swamp uh, was pretty shady. And these photographs were taking you know, well before leaf out. So you can imagine how shady it would be. Um, and the plant blooms in September well after leaf out. So we, again, got another crew, <laughs> traveled down to uh, Southern Maryland, removed about somewhere around 16 trees and a lot of small brush. And, treated the stumps like we did at Idlewild Fen to keep any herbicide from running off. And uh, so they're bucked and felled trees and basically just grunt work and took everything out. So the bottom two photos show 
you know, um, some areas that were um, there post thinning. So a lot more sunlight hitting the ground. Uh, there were more flowers this year. I don't have any great photographs, uh, but what we had to do was install some deer fencing and some deer cages to keep the deer from eating all of the flowers and, and all of the fruit, which we did. But the other thing, sort of the second part of this was, and uh, <laughs> so that's me trying to reach down in these little hummocks and pull out um, Japanese still grass. And you just sort of take a chair and you sit and you watch where your feet go and you end up pulling Japanese still grass for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and then hauling out the, the, the debris. So um, it's, we think that we have most of the area that the rare plant is, uh, that where the rare plant occurs um, free of microstegium, but it is, if anyone's ever dealt with the species, you know, it just keeps coming back. So that'll be a site that will definitely have to have a, a steward, you know, located somewhere down in Southern Maryland to sort of visit this place routinely. Because, you know, again, I'm on the Eastern shore. I live in Easton. It takes me two hours just to get there. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a sustainable thing. And I have you know, many, many other projects. So the, um, another um, plant conservation project uh, that was kind of a surprise, it just sort of popped up one year, was um, red milkweed. Of course, it doesn't look that red. It, the flower color can vary to red. It's a state endangered species. It's, been, it's under severe decline. Um, County distribution doesn't look that bad, but uh, we weren't sure that there were any plants left in Baltimore County. There were two plants counted in 1990. I have no hope for those. The Dorchester County population was a single plant. The Comico population had gone from about 35 to five plants and nearly half of the Worcester County sites were just gone. I mean, just gone. Uh, part of that was due to sea level rise, um, saltwater incursion. So some of the sites that we had known historically for this species were essentially dead loblolly pine and, um, and phragmites, reed. So it had been transformed from freshwater marsh into saltwater marsh. And this is not a salt tolerant species. Also intense deer browse. For whatever reason, deer like to eat red milkweed. And other, something else that's sort of inherent in the mating system of this plant is mate limitation. What I mean by mate limitation is that um, plants that are very closely related, just as in people or mammals or anything, anything else, um, they cannot produce seed. So there may be lots of pollination going on, but there's no fruit being produced. So there's no seed, there's nothing for the next, there's nothing, there's no next generation. It's just what is there. And, um, and long generation time, um, sort of like turtles. So I'm not sure how long it is. I'm not, uh, not clear on that, but it seems to me that this plant spends a very, very long time as a very small plant before it builds up enough carbon resources, or builds up enough energy to actually to actually flower. So this was um, kind of a dramatic uh, you know, wake up call to get busy. Um, so one of the first things I did at one of our more sustainable sites, it's on a wildlife management area, is you know don't mow it, please don't mow. So I posted signs. Um, the second thing was to install caging around the plants that were in these little wetland. These are permanently saturated wetlands to keep the deer from, from eating all the flowers. And uh, quite successfully, um, you know, a number of uh, you know, fruiting pods were produced and those seed were um, you know, dried, collected, and, um, and we introduced them into a managed wetland area that's not under a power line. It's really basically just right across the road. 
and I hope to have some results this year to show that that was um, that that was successful. So I didn't grow plants out and put them like with the cyperus. I just used direct seeding of seed from those pods. So we'll just see how it works out. That's how a lot of this conservation, um, a lot of these conservation projects just work in that you just try something and see if it works. So the last thing that I'll talk about is uh, something near and dear to my heart. There's a, there's an ecosystem, um, natural community called Inland Dune Woodlands. They're not really woodlands, they're more like um, prairies. And almost all of them had been um, either farmed or converted to loblolly pine plantations. And so again, you look at that photograph where Dr. John Hall is standing, it's not a forest area. And so uh, John is standing in a large patch of something called hairy snout bean. Yes, go ahead and get your giggles out. That's what it's called, Rincosia tomatosa after a spring burn. And what's interesting about that, if you don't know anything about the species and you probably don't, you never say large patch, ever. Uh, you find, you know, two or three plants here, two or three plants there, and it's always along some roadside or under a power line or along some sandy edge of a trail. And so for John to be wading through this incredibly rare plant, uh, let me know that, um, you know, uh, restoring fire to that landscape uh, mattered for the species and um, had had a dramatic impact within just a few years. You know, these plants were coming basically from an, uh, a seed bed that was underground. And so this little area um, is, was formerly um, a Gladfelter forest products area. So it was devoted to commercial timber uh, production. It was on a, a pulpwood rotation, which means about every 12 years they're, they're cutting the trees down. So the goal in, at Idlewild is to have about 250 acres of um, fire maintained habitat which sometimes requires, and I know folks, it looks, it's a moonscape, but um, that was mostly Virginia pine. So the little road where the truck is located, the little sand road, that was the only place that anything rare grew. Everything else was Virginia pine. And um, what Jason is looking at is, are the lupin plants that are popping up just inside the, uh, the, clear, the cleared zone. So the photograph of the lupin, which is a state threatened species, uh, was taken before that harvest occurred and uh, the year before that harvest occurred. And you see all that leaf litter? There's one thing that lupin can't stand is leaf litter. Um, so yes, it's a fairly harsh treatment. Um, Nothing grows under Virginia pine. Occasionally, I would find some of the other rare plants that just had barely enough sunlight to hang on. It'll be a few years before there will be enough fuel to carry uh, fire across that landscape. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll see some, some dramatic increase in uh, the population size of, of, um, of lupin at the, at the dunes. So the conservation targets, well, you know, it's the rare stuff, but um, there's lots of other conservation targets, but you got hairy snout bean, which is that little yellow plant to the left. Uh, wild lupin there in the middle, it's just, it's just gorgeous. And spitori pea, which is another little legume. So there's a theme here also of legumes, um, which are very typically um, require uh, open, so open sand in this case, but they also respond dramatically to, uh, to fire management. So for us, uh, the site how has the state's largest population of hairy snout bean, the second largest population in the state of the spiketory pea. Um, so the initial counts were about 48 plants. Now we're well over 400. I think John and I stopped about 480. Uh, last year. The Spitori pea, there was one plant and it was in the fire break. And, uh, and you know, now there's well over, well over 1,000. So 
so that's certainly a, a restoration um, success, but there's more to restoration of an ecosystem than just the things that are, that are very rare. So some of the things that are myth, not missing, but um, there's one species that's missing from the Eastern shore and from most of its coastal uh, habitat. World milkweed, so if you've been to Soldier's Delight, world milkweed is, is everywhere. It's Sclepias verticillata. It's all, it's probably occurs on every shale bear. But in its coastal habitats, these inland sand dunes and sand ridges, it's just gone. And I'm still hoping that there's a few plants somewhere that I haven't seen that we can use for uh, restoration, putting back in these dunes, and maybe the fires will you know turn it on. Uh, dwarf hawthorn is this cute little short uh, shrub. Um, it's there. Um, it's has been restricted to these trail sides and sandy roads for a long time. It's a woody plant, very long lived. Um, and we'll just have to see what fire management does. Uh, I think we have a, a, a few colonies that might be enveloped by you know, some of the um, some of the fire maintained areas. And in New Jersey tea, another typical shell barren, barren glades uh, species. So uh, these are some of the species we hope to see come back in and sort of complete the flora for, for that ecosystem. So um, those are the, um, the projects that I've been working on. And um, so at this point, um, I'll take any questions you have. That photograph is a Pycnanthium torii. That's a globally rare species. It only occurs in four states. Chris, so, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. I, I do have one, one thing really struck me, uh, if I can take the first question here, is, is how many of these you find in these weird places, like along a well-traveled road or under power lines? Um, you know, you would think these would be in more isolated places. So why are so many of them found in these sort of... They're the only houses? places that were left open that were maintained as open habitats. And that's pretty much it. Um, so historically, many of these species existed in an ecosystem that essentially was just gone. And the only places that were maintained to stay open were places like roadsides and power lines. Uh, whether those populations would have been sustainable over the long term, you don't know, because mowing is not fire. Fire has, a, has completely different effects, but they were at least able to hang on in these little marginal habitats. Um, roadside and power land populations were never considered protected because you just don't, you have no management authority. And so you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, again, you know, you have crews that come in, whether they know what's there, you have contractors, they're spraying herbicide, they don't know the plants there. Um, and next thing you know, I think that's what happened in at least one instance with red milkweed. Apparently, it does not do well under any herbicide applications. Many other plants do, so it's not a damning thing. It's just for that particular species, it essentially eliminated it from what had had been a fairly substantial population, whereas other rare plants, even some of the orchids said, yay, <laughs> now, we, now, we have, now we have unimpeded sun, but that species just couldn't take it. Um, so we have um, uh, a question here of someone asking, uh, did we skip over the Cedarville, uh, the Cedarville seep? When you did were we going through, through the list of uh, places uh, where work was being done. No, it was that that was the area where um, Jennifer was looking for the bee that's associated with that species and she couldn't find it and she was looking for thousands of flowering plants and she found seven. And did she, she only ever, found Did she ever find one of the bees? Nope, she did not. Hmm. She didn't find the bee, um, but the plant definitely was in trouble and we needed to try something so um, the cedarville seep is 
And the interesting thing about many of these rare plant locations is that you look at them. I mean, I'm not talking about roadsides or, or power lines. Those are different examples, but you look at the location and where it is and you're thinking, this looks exactly like every other seed and suitable state forest. Why is it only here? And that's a recurring theme in, in rare plant conservation. Is sometimes you just don't know. Why it, is it historical contingencies? Did something happen you know, to the other seeps? You, know, you, you, you just don't know. And uh, you sort of have to accept that after a while. But, um, at, uh, and, you know, on all of these rare plants, they face so many threats. Um, you know, the, the, the loss of habitat, the isolation of habitat, and then um, they have to contend with species from other continents that they've never, they did not evolve with, like microstegium, your Japanese steelgrass. Um, and I think the major effect of the Japanese steelgrass was that it grows very robustly and the plants are very small and it just lays on top of them. So basically they're just being suffocated. Um, someone is asking, how frequently do you think fires occurred on the coastal plain of Maryland? And I'm assuming they're meaning naturally um, once upon a time. It's difficult to know precisely, of course, because there's very few historical details. Um, but I do know that in the absence of fire, you end up with a forest or some sort of forest. And um, the very well documented are the great barons of Maryland. So um, Susquehanna River, west to Carroll County, and then south to DC was treeless. That was a prairie. And so something, most likely fire, maintained that enormous area as an open, as an open barren. So that's the kind of habitat that these species evolved in. And then um, as you know, colonization occurred and you know, wholesale changes in the environment occurred and Washington, Baltimore metropolitan area <laughs> occurred, uh, you know, those just, those just stopped. But it's interesting, um, it's another thing I can talk about for forever, there's an entire genus of witch, they're called witch grasses, the genus is called dicandelium. And Agnes Chase collected a lot of very rare ones like these prairie species right around DC. Um, although I guess this would have been you know, late 1930s, 1940s. And what I noticed on the herbarium specimens were that the, um, the basal leaves were scorched. So it had been burnt. And there are, you know, spotty fires. I'm not sure what the fire records are for the Eastern shore. It's just, you know, when you, when you see these extremely dry environments um, that are in, under, you know, under forest cover and all of your, all of the rare plants and sometimes the rare insects are in straight lines and right angles. In other words, wherever the roads or the power lines go, that's the only place that's left. They've been forced out into the open essentially. And so um, I'm guessing that much of that of the lower Eastern shore landscape had repeated fires and we're playing around with mimicking that fire regime. And so right now it looks like some places do really well with annual fires, no, no longer than, than five years. We have a question from Mark about how important are old growth forests for rare, threatened, and endangered plants? Most of the old growth that I know of is in, well, in the Eastern shore, it would be the bottoms, 
you know, the bottomlands, the rivers, the Atlantic white cedar swamps, bald cypress swamps, those stuff, that kind of, those kinds of areas that attained, you know, ancient ages. And yes, they have some rare plants, um, but the preponderance of rare plants on our list currently occur in open habitats. And certainly old growth has its place for some species, but most of those would be Western Maryland. But even there, when fire studies have been done, even some of the, you know, the, uh, some of the oldest, you know, oak hickory forests that we know of in Western Maryland, when they've done fire scar analysis, you know, it seemed to me, it seemed to be that the fire return interval was about seven years for hundreds of years. And we also have a question here. Can we have Maryland focus on deer control where endangered species are primarily located? And do we do fire management where fire is natural? We do do fire management where fire is natural, or at least historically it was natural. Deer management, you know, if you can solve that one, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, we, we try our best. Uh, it's, it's beyond the capability of hunters, I think, to control deer. We take um, sometimes extraordinary measures to um, safeguard rare plants to prevent them from being you know, basically decimated by, by deer. And I, I don't have, I wish I'd had images of it uh, today, but uh, Jennifer has, um, I think it's a couple of hectare areas that are actually fenced. So it's an electric fence. It's operated by, um, you know, so it's basically a solar powered electric fence. And it gets set up around the same area every year, not because of the plant, but because of the butterfly that uh, is an obligate, uh, the plant is an obligate host for the butterfly. So the butterfly has to have lupin and there has to be enough lupin for the butterfly to have a population size. So there's this very large fence. And our um, colleague who's since moved on, Pete Stango, took some drone pictures. So we sent up a drone. So he's taking photographs of the dune. And what was striking about it is in, within the fence, there's this polygon and it's purple. Outside of the fence, yeah, there's some purplish blips out there. But it lets you know what kind of impact deer will have on a, on a rare plant. It's really kind of an extraordinary um, uh, image of um, what can happen. So we're, but we're, you know, that's, uh, I mean, it's, it's hunted. Uh, it's not like hunting is not allowed, but it's just, you have these enormous populations of herbivores and they're important you know as well but um boy it, it probably also has to do with small population size i don't think that we'd be so obsessed with deer management if these plants were just everywhere but because essentially we we have our eggs all in one basket or very few baskets uh, that any impact upon them is is um, detrimental, and deer are one of those are one of those impacts. And so, in your work, how do you balance the effort to try to bring attention to the plight of these plants with the efforts to actually protect them from people? Because I assume you don't advertise where they are, or you would have hordes of people going out there trying to see them. Well, I think that's true to some extent. I mean, I, I, I don't suspect that even if I put a dot on the map, many people would, would run out to see Plucanet cyparis. <laughs> it's just not, it's just not a, it's not a very attractive plant. And, you know, probably, you know, one out of every 100 people could even find a key to identify it. Uh, it's just not something that's very pretty. Um, um, where you're, you know, Audubon, you, you have a beautiful bird 
that shows up that's extremely rare, very unusual. I mean, you experience the same things. You know, it's like everybody wants to go see this bird. And we've had some instances um, where there has been some visitation, not because of, of Maryland Biodiversity Project or, or, or DNR producing information um, to let people know where things like rare orchids, which are gorgeous. And I, I totally understand why people want to see these things. They're just absolutely beautiful. And to photograph them and to look at them in ooh and awe, but just like a rare bird sighting, one or two people, sure, no, you know, no impacts at all. Yeah, let people look. A couple hundred in a very small area, a very sensitive habitat, that can be, you know, that can be definitely detrimental. But I think mostly it comes from people not knowing how to obscure the um, the locations that they post. I mean, I didn't know for years until Pete Stango told me, he was sort of a tech genius at, at DNR. He was like, well, you've got photographs. So I'll just pull the lat longs off of that because you didn't have any, you didn't have a good GPS signal. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Embedded in my photo or GPS points? And he said, duh, of course there are. Because sometimes your cell phone will have more precise data because of the towers. The towers sort of figure out where you are. So you have, yes, you're using satellites, but it's the cell phone towers that, that sort of triangulate your position. And sometimes it can be fairly uh, enlightening to see how close it had me you know, on the ground from my photograph. So if you don't know how to obscure those location details, sometimes that can show up on, you know, iNaturalist and other places. And, and so, but at least, you know, Jim Brighton and the folks at MVP, they strip those coordinates. You can't, you know, you can't pull out a, you can't pull out one of their photographs, which are fantastic and get a GPS coordinate from it. This just doesn't happen. Yeah, and we have that same issue in dealing with endangered birds and especially around their nest of, you know, being careful what you post out there because people can find the exact location. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they, and I understand, I, I understand why people, want, they're enthusiastic about it. It's not that anyone intends to do any harm. That's not, I don't think that's their, I don't think that's the motivation. The motivation is not to do harm. The motivation is to see something that's extraordinary. Well, Chris, this has been absolutely fascinating and you're doing just amazing work there to try to protect these little plants. So we can't thank you enough for spending your time tonight um, sharing the research you've done. You're very and welcome. Um, and I'll uh, be down in Southern Maryland soon. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. And we're getting uh, some great thank yous in the chat box too. All right. Thank you guys. And thank have a good you. night. You too.